Hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. So good morning, everyone. Today we are talking to author, historian and archaeologist Norena Shopland, all about her book, A History of Women in Men's Clothes, from Cross-Dressing to Empowerment. I'm really excited to have you here on the podcast, Norena. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. No, it's completely fine. Um, you know, I think this is a, a fantastic book and I'm awesome. really excited to get into this with you. That's kind of you to say, thank you. Now, first, first question, uh, where did you originally get the idea for this book then? Um, multiple sources, really, because a lot of the work that I, I do um, is on the history of sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, namely lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people in Wales, and also Welsh history, uh, looking specifically at, at Welsh women. And any historian knows that women's history lags a long way behind men's. Um, and so I've always tried to bring to the fore new and exciting stories about women from the past. And I had done this with my, my previous book, Forbidden Lives. And because I wanted to include women, uh, particularly women that we would today regard as gay, um, it, it was difficult because terminology doesn't exist past the late 19th century. And so it was necessary to come up with all new terminology for, for trying to find um, people. Um, and that resulted in a couple of research guides. One was for Glamorgan Archives called Queer in Glamorgan, which was all about how to search archives. And then it, it turned into a book with Routledge called A Practical Guide to Searching LGBTQIA Historical Records. And so I was using this methodology to try and find people from the past and had to stop looking at what people are and started looking at what people were doing and what they were doing was cross-dressing. And I began to realize very, very quickly that um, this was the whole of women's history. This, this is, didn't apply to one specific part of, of women. It was everybody, all women were doing it. And so it became less a book about uh, cross-dressing, looking at sexual orientation and gender identity. And it became more um, a history um, of a part of women's history. And it's it's interesting to see that spread where you mentioned it was everybody, everybody doing it. Now, I just wanted to say, like, you know, this is a, this is an important era of history. And like you've just said, it's it's often not touched upon. And, and women's history uh, sadly lacks very far behind men's history. Why is it important for this history then to be told and highlighted? Well, you know, I've, I've read so many sort of history books on on women in the past and we're sort of taught this idea that because women were so restricted in the home and you couldn't go out without a chaperone, and we, we very much look at how restrictive women's lives were in the past. And so this is like, no, no, if, in fact, a lot of women didn't do that. You know, if you wanted to visit your sick auntie down the road and you didn't have a man to accompany you, um, you borrowed your husband's or your son's or your servant's clothes and you went off by yourself. And I think we need to start looking um, at a lot of women were doing precisely that. They were doing what they wanted to do, because when you restrict 50 percent of society in such a way, they are going to find ways around it. I mean, that, that's obvious that we can see that in any history that once you restrict people, they will bend the rules. Yeah, it falls into that that trope really. When there's when there's a will, there's a way, um, yeah. and, it, and and you definitely demonstrate that throughout the book. So where where does the history of of cross cross dressing begin then? From the earliest of times. Um, I mean, you go right back to the Bible, and a lot of um, the prohibition is set in the Bible. Deuteronomy 22.5, a man may not wear the clothes of a woman, a woman may not wear the clothes of a man, because both are an abomination unto thy Lord God. Um, and, and that, you know, when we look back at sort of the medieval times and early history, where society is so much dominated by religious views, we see that a lot of the laws of the land are taken from biblical edits. Um, and certainly, we see when many of the women are arrested that um, the judges and, and the magistrates quote the Bible at them. And they say, you know, you are an offense to God because it says in Deuteronomy 22, five. So it started from the earliest of times. And going back to the previous point, the minute you start saying 
men have to wear these clothes and women have to wear those clothes. You will get people breaking the rules. So I'm sure there are times before, you know, printed history that we can look at that, that people were doing it. And when it's, it's, it's happening to all women and it's interesting that it's just, it whilst you're putting people in different groups, they're still doing it and they're still trying to find ways. Uh, and speaking about, you know, groups and different people trying to find ways around it, um you you mentioned in your book different different age groups and different class groups um you know whilst they have very different lives have they got different reasons for cross-dressing then people in the upper classes or older women compared to younger women and working class women many i mean the the reasons are myriad that they they you know it, it's almost personal to to women uh yes you can put them into groups as i've done in the book i mean it breaks into you know people who who did it to get a job uh women who who were escaping domestic violence you know when you you have a situation where men essentially own women uh, right up to sort of like right up to the, the late 19th century women were restricted in what they they could do you know because of what men said um you know you, you you've where do you go if if you're suffering domestic violence where do you go um so in for many cases it was easier for women to become men and disappear and move to another place and start again. So, um, you know, women did it for jobs. They did it for um, rich people, certainly. Um, Isabella Bird, the, the great explorer, she complains that as a woman, there's nothing to do but drudgery, drudgery all day. Um, and so she goes off exploring and cross-dresses as a man. Uh, Gertrude Bell complains that she wants to go to the National Gallery, but there's no man to take her. Um, and if only there was, she would go there every day. So while you have those kind of leisure activities for women for who, are, who are richer, when you look at working class women, then you begin to see that for a lot of them, it was a necessity. Um, escaping domestic violence, getting more money. Men were always paid much higher than women and still are. Um, and so, you know, it was obvious when we look at it to say, see, a woman who maybe has lost her husband through death or he's up and gone um, on women's wages, they couldn't cope. So she put on men's clothes and went off and got a job. And and like you said, it's definitely down to necessity and it's very sad to see some of these reasons why they're cross-dressing still issues that affect society today, such as, such as pay and so on and domestic violence. Absolutely. Now, one of these... One of the major player in the reaction to to cross dressing, as you mentioned in your book, and and probably still one of the major players today regarding the same things is is the media. So how did how did the media react to to women who cross dressed? It, it changes throughout the times. Um, initially, uh, when women were um, arrested, the, the thing is that many countries in Europe had a law against women and men cross-dressing uh, and you could be arrested. In the UK, we never had a law that you could go to jail for cross-dressing. A lot of, of the European countries did. And France didn't repeal its law about women wearing trousers until 2013. Um, I mean, it was ignored, obviously, you know, yeah. just ignored it. Um, so a lot of the reasons we know about the women is because they're arrested. Um, and the media initially treated these cases as, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, you know, how could this woman do this? This is so shameful. But they wouldn't name them because they didn't want to add the shame to the woman and more importantly, to the family. They didn't want to shame the family. Um, in later, uh, sort of from the mid 19th century onwards, you see newspapers, the tax on newspaper is removed, paper is so much cheaper. And you see this proliferation of newspapers in the second half of the 19th century. Well, then the gloves are off because everybody's looking for sensational stories. And so they started naming the women. Um, and so uh, for a lot of the time though, there was this kind of tolerant attitude because people understood why women wanted to do it. When you have a society where 50% of the people are superior, 
who have all the opportunities, all the, the they get to do all the fun things, and 50% of society who's considered inferior, then you can understand why women wanted to take the, the superior position. They wanted all the fun things that men were doing. The opposite was not the same. If men cross-dressed, society couldn't understand it. Why would you lower yourself to an inferior position? People just scratched their heads and said, this doesn't make sense. So while they understood it, why women did it, they didn't understand it while why men did it. And also for men, there was the association with homosexuality uh, that with women um, that there wasn't that association in, in quite so much way. And, you know, seeing those seeing those reactions, you still in some quarters get those reactions to people who do those those things today, uh, where those labels are attached to them by, as you said, sensationist uh, media outlets. But I mean, um, you look at today, who comments about women wearing trousers? Nothing. Nobody. Nothing. Um, you put a man in a dress and the media goes crazy. You yeah. know, um, so it, the, a lot of that is still, as you say, around today. And what was the reaction to these these people who were caught cross-dressing then? Or, or what was their reaction to them being caught? It depended how long they'd been doing it. I mean, you, you can see yeah. in, in their answers, you know, some of the women had become old hands. Uh, and what you begin to see is this the same terminology creeping through. So they'd always have the same excuse. Oh, I only did it for a lark. Um, oh, my husband beat me. Oh, the, the most favourite um, answer was following a man. Um, if you said this man, you know, he promised to marry me and he's left me and I'm bereft and I'm all alone. So I'm trying to look for him. The whole of society went, oh, poor dears. And it was all very understandable. Uh, and most of the time they wouldn't give the men's name and they were made up stories. It was just, you know, so the old hands had learned yeah. all the answers to give. The the people who were trying it for the first time um, quite often burst into tears and I promised not to do this again. And, you know, some of the old hands would also burst into tears and, like, and you know, I promise not to do this again. You know, So it, it very much depended on how long they had been doing it to how they reacted to being caught. I mean, at those days, you know, particularly, you know, we get most of our, our information for this sort of subject from the, from the 19th century because there's such a proliferation of papers. Um, and, and a lot of the... The women they just shrug it off and they're like, okay, bye. <laughs> and it's uh it's interesting to see those kind of reactions and those, like you said, those old hands saying, Oh, I only did it for a lark, and these stock uh kind of excuses coming out. I think it's 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 quite nice to see everyone's on the same page with what to say. <laughs> you you often see it with I mean the, the female soldiers and female sailors, of which there are so many, you, you know, you have to stop collecting because um, you know, and again, going back to, to why the importance of this work, you often see stories about female soldiers and female sailors. And, and there are a number of books written on the subjects, but they're always put on the queer shelf, the diversity shelf. They're not put on the library shelves in the military history and naval history. And we need to do that. We need to get these these kind of books into mainstream history. Um, so you, you see a lot of the women who, when they are caught and promise never to do it again, they simply change their name and change the regiment and go off and do it again. So, you know, uh, you didn't stop a lot of these women. They were great. <laughs> yeah, so it certainly fills into that when there's a will, there's a way again. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Now, some some of these some of these women cross dressing could be associated with the modern terms of uh, being a lesbian or being trans. How common was it for women to cross dress because of their sexuality? When I started writing the book, that that was my initial sort of aim to uncover more individuals that we would today recognise as lesbian and trans. Um, and, and as I said before, it, it turned into a, a women's history book. And so, I mean, there are a couple of chapters in the book uh, specifically covering those topics. 
but it it then became in the same way as society the sort of about a ten percent of of the research and ten percent of the book was about those people we would recognize as lesbian and trans so it fits very neatly into how we see society today um they are a, a sort of you know a, a percentage of diversity and um so yeah it's it very much reflects society that but the stories are great i mean a lot of the stories had never been published outside their original source and so i was able to bring a lot of new stories um, and, and therefore add to the history of, of sexual orientation and gender identity. And, and the key is visibility. Once we see that people have been around since the year dot and, and we're going to stay here till the you know, end of time, people begin to realize that, you know, well, why are you discriminating against these people? You know, they've always been here. They always will be. And, and what was what was the, you know, how did the period navigate the complexities of some of these people being either lesbian or trans then? Um, towards the 19th century, it, it becomes more noticeable. Quite often women would uh, go and live together and they would claim to be sisters or cousins or best friends. And quite often one individual would become a man um, in order to have the sort of relationship that that you know, they and we today want that it's just a normal relationship. It's just part of life. And and so the, often the only way they could do it uh, was for one of them to pass as a man. And, and many of them were incredibly successful when we find out about people quite often only because they've died and they've ended up on the coroner's table and, and you, you know, you undress the body and there's the realisation. And but these people who were living together for like 40 years or something and trans people who were living um, cross living as men for, for 40, 50 lifetimes, you know. So um, people were, were doing this throughout history. But when you've got that more sensational media in, in particularly in the late 19th century, then, you know, you've got magistrates leaking stories to the press and things. And that, therefore you get this build up from, from the mid to late centuries of disapproval. So whereas a lot of um, individuals we would today regard as lesbian and trans who are in relationships were accepted um, as we move towards the late 19th, early 20th century, then it starts to become unacceptable. And... When you like, you know that that historical period as well as historians have kind of hidden it through oh they were friends yeah. uh, they were sisters and I think it's important to get that visibility across as you've said uh, to kind of I think it's only now is that being challenged. Absolutely, I mean we've had to develop a criteria to measure what is supposed to be a friend or or as they called it in the past romantic friendships. Uh, where, where, for example, like the ladies of Llangollen, where two women live together, they live together for 50 years. Um, and throughout, ever since their death um, in, the, in the early 19th century, people have tried to claim they were just friends. You can't prove they had sex. Therefore, you can't prove that today we would regard them as lesbians, as if sex is the only thing that, you know, that matters. Um, so, yeah, so we had to develop a criteria that says, well, you know, friends do this, but don't do that. But, you know, same sex couples do that, but don't. So you have to have a sort of tick box exercise that at the end of the day says the evidence on the, these, these criteria lends the support that these are most probably people in a relationship. And it's important to have something like that so we can give visibility to yeah. these people in history and, and probably and give more role models to to young people within these communities as well i think that's awesome yes, i think one of the things that i'm working extensively on at the moment um is uh, particularly with the welsh government their funding training for local museums and archives so that we get away from mainstream histories and we're looking more at local histories and the more information we uncover then the more that you know schools and history groups can celebrate local people to show that people have been in the local area for you know thousands of years um and and i think that's that's the importance of the way to go forward, that we must start start celebrating local histories. Yeah, it's, certainly, it's certainly something that needs to be definitely more highlighted on national curriculums. Um, yeah. 
and there's definitely there's definitely been an increased drive from some quarters uh for that inclusion now another another group that that often cross dressed were uh sex workers uh and they often cross dressed as men for different reasons so what 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 were these reasons and what type of men did they cross dress as what? It, it was for multiple reasons. As was anything in this book, there were so many reasons, you know, you can't. Um, prostitution in the certainly in the nineteenth century was absolutely rife. It, it was, you know, huge. Um, and I had come across uh, references to cross-dressing among sex workers for a long time, and had kind of assumed, well, yeah, it makes sense, you know. But when I started looking it in depth. Um, and this is really one of the first studies that, that has been looking at this. Um, I began to realize, I, I started doing a little map, you know, I started pinpointing where everybody was on this map and found that they were predominantly in ports and barracks. So they are quite specifically targeting soldiers, soldiers and sailors. Um, and you, you have to ask, well, why, why? Um, well, so was every other prostitute. And, and so we, in this time, men didn't really see the outline of women's figures very often. So, you know, if you are a man who uses prostitutes, you know, you, you sort of like same oh same a prostitute. But if somebody turns up in in tight fitting trousers, and the, the, one of the reasons that society didn't like women wearing trousers, and and you see this in countries today is that they think it sexualizes the woman because it emphasizes the buttocks and the hips and, and, and the breast. And so when you've got somebody who walks in there, a man's going to think, oh, this is a bit different. And um, so not only is it for titillation purposes to try and get a, a bigger male audience, but it's also catering for the homosexual market for men who are gay in, in soldiers and sailors um, who, who then can, you know, this, it's a bit more closer to their desires. So there were a lot of reasons why they did it. They did it for economic reasons to try and get more trade. Um, yeah. And, and were, were men cross-dressing within the same the same sphere? Yes, I mean, you do get male cross-dressing. Um, that was to cater predominantly for the homosexual market. And you see, as I said before, there are a lot... Uh, with a woman who was cross-dressing, if she was caught, it was usually just the usual fine. For men, it, it was much more, and, and they could be fined and imprisoned, and there was there were the penalties for men um, working as sex workers cross-dressing uh, because there was that link with homosexuality, because women very rarely access sex workers, so it, it is for the male market. So if a man is cross-dressing, um, then he's doing something very specifically uh, attracting men in a specific way and that was seen as homosexuality and so therefore the the penalties against men cross-dressing in sex industry uh, were much harsher than for women and it's you know you see that that's another point where there's you know the different attitudes from the bible are coming through um and we're seeing that you know persecution of people um which is you know hope, hope starting to go away uh but sadly in some quarters uh, some places in the world it's not yeah yeah i mean you just last year a woman uh mp in in um uh, tanzania was ejected from the parliament for wearing trousers so you know the the, the whole thing about women wearing trousers that it's a sexualized thing it's, it's still present in many countries you know look at the arabic countries it's the same thing that women wear trousers it's seen as sexualizing the woman yeah, and uh, I think it's definitely a good point to to point out that you know that this these attitudes are you know, prevalent still, and I think it's a good educational point there for people listening. Um, but I'd like to touch on the economic reasons then for women cross dressing, as you mentioned. There are other industries, and we've already briefly touched on it. There are other industries where there was an economic benefit uh, for women to to cross dress. Um, what other work could they acquire then and what what benefits were there for these women uh you know including the economic benefits for them 
in almost every type of job you see men doing, you see women doing as well. Um, you know, in the book, there's the stories about women, women hangmen, women steeplejacks climbing up steeples and churches to repair them and all north. And, and some women did it with, with their husbands because to have a partnership where you've got essentially what looks like a male partner, uh, you can earn more money. For a lot of women, the economic reason was to get men's wages, particularly in a time when there's no divorce, there's no separation, you are bound by religious constructs that you have to stay within a marriage for the sake of the husband and the children and society. And the husband may die, he may desert the woman, um, he may be disabled, if particularly in, in industries where there's, there's hard labour. And you know, what did you do? Did you go to the workhouse? Because women's wages weren't enough to bring a family up on. So they had to find another way. And you often see things like where you get sort of companies coming through making roads and railways, um, paying really good wages. And so women would cross dress as men and go off and get a job. Some of the times people understood and recognised that these were women and just turned a blind eye because they knew that women had to try and earn money and so a lot of them did it for um to keep the family together the difficulty is once you've done it and you've got the high wages and you've got the respect and and you know this is the other thing the way women were treated was much less respectful from the way men were treated so suddenly now you're an inferior being before you're not treated with respect you haven't got much very much money so you go off and you work on the railways and suddenly people are speaking to you with respect, you know, that you're, you're getting good money. You, you've got freedom to walk around as you want that women don't have. Why would you give it up? Yeah, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, so I can understand why some of these women didn't want to give that up and, and didn't want to move along. And a lot of these industries that you're mentioning and these, these jobs that you're mentioning are very labour intensive. Mm. Um, so what type of what type of jobs did they do in these labour intensive industries and, and how did they evade detection? They, anything. Um, as I said before, any job that men were doing, you know, there were there are women coal miners, there are um, it's working, labouring on, on the roads, railways, farm work. Um, there were women who crossed, lived for many, many years, who became mayors of a town, policemen, um, really important people um and they they did it for as i said enormous number of reasons sorry i've lost track of what yeah, that's right yeah and and then how did they evade detection then oh, uh, they evade detection. Yeah. yeah um a lot of the time people did turn a blind eye you know when when you look at the uh, stories coming out, particularly after they'd been arrested. You know, you have people going, "Oh well, yeah, I, I knew, I knew." You know, <laughs> um, and then other people, they had to protect themselves. They had to protect themselves from the employers and the police and everything. Like and they'd sit there going, "Oh, I never knew. I never knew. I didn't. I didn't know." Um, so, and the clothes, you know, were much baggier. If you're doing a lot of manual work, you know, you you need to wear very baggy clothes. And women's bodies, when you do a lot of hard labor, become very androgynous. You know, all bodies, once you start doing a lot of hard physical labor, bodies become quite androgynous. Um, so in, in that point, you know, where you've got an androgynous body, particularly when you're younger, you can wear baggy clothes. Um, obviously, you've got the problem with the lack of Adam's apple. You've got higher voices, smaller hands and feet. So they a lot of the women would work on that. They would try and deepen their voice and, you know, um, and very quickly they would have to adopt the ways that men uh, walked and talked. One of the difficulties when women first started doing this was that they didn't know how to walk like a man. You know, the, men are, are the superior beings. They, they walk with enormous confidence. Women walk with less confidence. And so they had to learn, literally had just how to walk as a man, how to 
behave in respect to other people, that they are equals to men, where they spent all their lives being inferior. So they had to learn all these new tricks. And it could be extremely difficult, which is why when you see with a lot of women who first start cross-dressing, they're caught very quickly, um, because you can tell just by their walk or their voice. Um, so it, it was a lot of work to learn how to, to live as men. It's a lot. It's a lot of work that you don't appreciate goes on uh, for mm -hmm. these women to have to to have to benefit their lives and help their families. What What did the employers do then? If these, you know, as you've already mentioned, some of them, are, oh, I didn't know uh, to try and protect themselves. So, what What did a lot of these employers do after these women had been detected? Quite often, they they said that, oh, we didn't know. And didn't didn't have a clue. We were so surprised, <laughs> um, you know. And you know, yeah, um, nothing really. I mean, quite often they would sack them. You see this with with uh, female sailors and soldiers. The particularly with sailors, they go off on a boat and you're on on a ship for for six months or something, and and the person is detected, and and the captain says, "Oh, I didn't have a clue." Sacks them and keeps their wages. Um, because they said, well, you you lied when you came on board. So they keep the low ages them for themselves. Um, so it varies enormously, but most of the time they say, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know. <laughs> and it's quite, it's a very easy way to get yourself out of trouble as well at that point. Now, now speaking of trouble, some some women decided to, to cross-dress, as you've outlined in your book, for criminal purposes. Uh, what What were the reasons for them? doing this um a lot of it practical i mean if you're a burglar you can't go around burgling a, a house in a skirt you know <laughs> so um you know it, it was very difficult and quite often that they would sort of uh, be with men so they would they would cross dress in either in order to access buildings quicker and that sort of thing but there's also another um form of criminality in that they would become men and woo women um, and then they would con them out of their money. They would promise them marriage and everything um, and, and um, yeah, steal money from them. So there were lots of all the same reasons that everybody else commits crimes. Uh, women would do. There, there are a couple of instances of murder where, you know, um, particularly a woman who uh, there's one story of a woman who uh, was spurned by her man. So she went and shot him. Um, but in order to get to him, she had to travel on the railway. So, of course, she cross-dressed as a man um, and then, you know, found him and shot him. Uh, so you do find, you know, and, and other other play, you know, particularly with women trying to find errant husbands who've gone off uh, with another woman. Um, and they'll, they'll sort of cross-dress in order to travel to find him. Uh, again, because people, society are more willing to talk to men than they were to women. So they would they would uh, go off in search of the husband and, and maybe throw acid in his face or something like that. So um, there were there were lots of different as with everything in the book. There's lots of different reasons. <laughs> for everything. And go, it's not going on to a slightly more noble, as some people believe it's the side of life. And, and we've already touched on it ever so slightly with women going to war, women going to be sailors. Uh, how long a history do we have of women cross-dressing to go to war? From the beginning of war. Uh, you look right back at the classical times, Greek and Roman stories, you'll find women there. In every war, you will find women. And they do it again for a number of reasons. A lot of it was to follow the man. Um, you know, Jane de la Foy in, in France, when her husband is called up, she, she cross-dresses as a man and goes with him. And you see a lot of this. A lot of the women said they, they went to, to stay with their husbands or boyfriends. or um, uh, But there were a lot of women also who were equally patriotic as men. Um, and wanted to fight for their country. And the only way they could do it was to, to become men and, and fight. There were women who just enjoyed it. They wanted to do it. They, they loved it. You know, they joined up, had a great time um, and just carried on. And, you know, a lot of women, even after they were recognised, were awarded uh, medals and honours and things. So, and of course, the, the, the media loved these kind of stories. So the more the media wrote about them, the more women wanted to do it. Well, I was I was I was just going to ask you to, to expand on that point, actually. The effects of women knowing that women were fighting. What, what, what kind of effect was that having? 
It had a huge effect, um, you know, particularly as a lot of the familiar refrains would creep into the newspapers. So women felt, well, I've got all the answers. So if I get caught, I know what to say. I know what to do. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it, it was. And, and a lot of the women, particularly with the, the um, soldiers and sailors, as I said before, when they were caught, they just changed their names and went off and did it again. And it's 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 fantastic to see that you know they're they're inspiring women and they're and they're they they believe and they're they're able to do the same thing as men and being rewarded it uh, rewarded yeah. for it uh, by higher up bodies with medals and so on. Now, obviously, obviously, you've mentioned you know the, the stop phrases, redress, go to another regiment. It's it would seem it'd be more difficult for women uh, to try and evade detection in war. Uh, you know the injuries are, are more prevalent in these in these theatres so how did women escape detection in in war uh, quite often they would bribe um there, there's quite a lot of um accounts of women who um, were bribing the doctors and the nurses not to tell uh, anyone but yes i mean a lot of women didn't go to the medical profession when they were injured you see stories of um you know buying these various concoctions to, to cure their, their wounds by themselves because they refused. There was one woman who was dying on, on the battlefield and, and she absolutely refused to have any medical help. And she probably died because she refused the medical help because she knew she would be discovered. Um, so there was a lot of bribery going on. There was a lot of evasion of, of uh, sort of medical help. Um, and and in some in a lot of cases they were assisted by men. In in some cases you see that the bribery was done by the men to protect them. Um, so a, a lot of people did help them. It was so prevalent that a, a lot of men knew about it and accepted it. So in order to evade capture, quite often you you would get a sympathetic man on your side as well. Um, and and again, if if you were if people began to suspect then they just went oh i'm a woman by the way um, converted back to female clothes escaped all kinds of punishment um changed their name and went off and joined another regiment and it's a it's as you've mentioned it's a fascinating part of military history that definitely needs to have have more lights on it because there was I, some... I want uh, yeah I want <laughs> to do a book just on the Napoleonic Wars because there's so many yes. women in the Napoleonic Wars and I don't think it's been done before the Civil War in America has been done um and and we can see that there were thousands and thousands of women in, in the American Civil War and we have to bear in mind this is just the women we know about you know how many more thousands did we we we, we never find out about because they never entered the the written record yeah it's like, I think you mentioned in your book, the only, you know, we only really know the ones who are caught. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's definitely, there's so much more history out there that we'll never know and be never be able to tell, really. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the, the, the great things about about these these types of history, really. It's interesting that um, since the book came out, uh, a number of, of readers have contacted me and said, oh, you know, when my uncle died, um, we didn't realise until the funeral, you know, where, where they, you know, preparing the body, um, that my uncle was a biological female. Um, so, you know, even today, people are saying to me, oh, you know, yeah, the, we, stories from our family, we know about this. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, to know that, that your book is is resonating with your readers well must be a fantastic feeling. <laughs> yeah, I, I love hearing the stories that come back, you know, and, and yeah, it's just great. Now, so, so moving from one theatre, the theatre of war, into the theatre, um, where you know we have we go from illegal cross dressing to cross dressing that is very much legal. Uh, what type of cross dressing was going on in the theatres, and you know why? You know what? Why? Why were they cross dressing? Um, <laughs> why is the easiest one for male to yeah. <laughs> Um, again, going back to what I said earlier, you know, men rarely saw the outlines of a woman's body um, because you've got these big dresses or, or very loose, you know, for working class women, these very loose skirts and dresses and pinafores and everything. So, so men didn't really see women's outlines. So they, they would go to the theatre. And um, of course, once 
the sort of theatre owners and, and the playwriters began to realise that men turned up in their droves to see women on stage. You know, they could see their legs, you know. They were like, ah, oh, this is a good idea. So they started um, writing more and more plays for women who are cross-dressing as men. Um, and for some women, they, they even wrote it into their contract. You have to do it. And a lot of um, actresses said, no, I'm not doing that. It's shameful. I'm not, you know. And so they would lose roles because they refused. And a lot of women realized that it was all about male desire and didn't want to go that route so they were very clear but yes it, apart from sort of prostitution it, it's really the only other area where you know um women cross-dressing is very visible that it is women cross-dressing they're not trying to be men um they are there specifically to for men's interest in women so it's it's a different it's kind of different um, tack there, and um, throughout the nineteenth century, there there were so many plays uh, plays by their thousands, um, for for the specific purpose. But the storylines were all the same. Um, you know, at the end, you always have to be found out. You always have to um, go back to your proper place in society so all the characters had to conform to you know the man found out and, and the man is the hero and the woman relies on him um and so they they get very very well, naff little roles of that even though they get for the first half of the play to play the hero play the man um, they have to go back to their proper roles in the end. But you can understand why women wanted to play these roles. And you start to see women taking on roles like Hamlet and Romeo because there were no decent roles for women. You know, the women were always the, and you see this right up to the late 20th century in films and TV. Women were always the sort of pretty object on the screen, didn't have much role, doesn't get the meaty part. Um, so, of course, women want to play more significant roles. And so you see a lot of women playing Hamlet and Romeo and Macbeth and, and you know, um, you, the famous Sarah Bernhardt. The first film of Shakespeare ever made was with Sarah Bernhardt, Chris Dressing as a pat man, having a sword fight. <laughs> um, of course, they wanted to play these meaty roles, the, the roles that have got more significance. Um, but no, for the most part, they were shoved into the, um, uh, you know, the the titillation role. And it's it's you know going from those as you say naff little roles to roles with more depth would definitely allow them to show their skill as actresses. And you know, some of these actresses were immensely talented. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can see why wanting to move into different roles such as Hamlet and and Romeo would be increasingly attractive for them. Mm -hmm. No, well, Sarah Bernhardt was was probably the most famous actress of the day, um, and you know she she got fed up of playing the the secondary role. Um, so you know the moment she got to play Hamlet, you know she was away with it. She was great, and she got huge compliments. And also it meant that those individuals were we today regard as lesbian and trans. It gave them the opportunity to be on stage, sort of in in a romantic scene with yeah. a woman, um, and a lot of uh, women who were uh, actors then were lesbian or trans in their real life. Um, you know, uh, people like Charlotte Cushman, the American actor who, who had several wives um, and she was incredibly famous. Um, and again, she played Romeo. And she, so there you have, and the audience thought there was nothing wrong with a woman cross-dressing as a man, playing a love scene with a woman. They thought it was free of all sexual innuendo and that, oh, this is really nice. And, you know, everybody else is sitting there going, hmm, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, going from one one sphere in the entertainment world to another, uh, we can move into sports. And you, you talk about women cross-dressing in, in sports to participate. What were the traditional attitudes surrounding women in sport? Bad. <laughs> um, again, you know, we go back to this. Why did they do it? Well, men were all playing the sports. They were playing, like, playing cricket and, and uh, football and horse riding and all that. And, you know, of course women wanted to do it. You know, why shouldn't they? And we look at today, we're still struggling with women in football. You know, come on. 
Um, so of course women wanted to play as well. So they would set up their own teams um, and, you know, playing, you know, hockey and cricket and football in skirts and dresses is, is not, not, you know, <laughs> yes, it can be done, but not as easily. And also there was the, the, the shame thing. If you fell over and your skirt rode up, you know, oh my God, there would be horror. Um, so the women started wearing trousers. They weren't cross-dressing. They, they were wearing trousers, but it was seen as men's clothes. Women were not allowed to wear men's clothes and trousers were men's clothes. Um, and again, you see the same sort of thing as with the theater. You get thousands of mainly men turning up to watch these football matches just to ogle the women. Um, and they, they turned into quite rowdy events at times. Um, and it, it took a long time for women to be accepted because they were constantly being derided for wearing trousers uh, and people were forgetting to actually talk about the football match. And, yeah, you know, we, still, we still see, like you've just said, we still see a lot of these these attitudes towards women's sports, where it's only been recently where sporting manufacturers have actually made women's specific sports kits yeah. instead of them having to wear men's football shirts yeah. and so on. Um, you know, and and, and, t- and talking about football, uh, women's football uh, is incredibly important and off the back of the Euro- women's Euros as well. Yeah, you know, When did women start to play football? Uh, and you've already mentioned a reaction to it, but when did they start? Um. Well, it, it came sort of, they started playing cricket first. There were women's cricket teams before women's football. Um, but from about the 1850s, 60s, you see these teams start. They started off as part of the circus shows. Um, so it was considered entertainment in, in an unusual fashion. You know, come and see a women's football match. And you see a lot of these matches. Um, there was a big club in Scotland and Northern England. Um where women played matches as it was entertainment. It wasn't a football match. It was an entertainment. Um, But then women started saying, well, hang on a second. We like this. We're going to play football properly. And you start to see a lot of women's matches in the late 19th century. And the attendance is very, very high, more so than for men's football, which is why women's football was then banned. And uh, when, when, when were they able to play again, just out of, just out of curiosity there. Not until, well, I, I can't remember when the, the law changed or the rules changed that allowed women's teams to play. It was like early, sort of mid 20th century. So we're talking about right up to mid 20th century. It was still not acceptable for women to play football. And then, of course, you see women's football clubs starting. And I can't remember the date where they were accepted into to FIFA and all that sort of. But this is modern history. A lot of yeah. it's in memory. So we talk about history. We talk about, you know, look at women playing football in the 19th century. Um, but it's only recently that FIFA have allowed women's football in. So that's, that's generations of women there who have been marginalised and uh, removed from something that they love and enjoy. Yeah. Um, so you know, definitely, it's definitely a huge achievement to see how quickly women's football has grown yeah. uh, in recent years. Now, the main the main point of your book is is women in men's clothes. Um, you know, when when does women's fashion begin to change between uh, towards women wearing uh, things that are closely related to men's clothes or being accepted to wear men's clothes? The bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, ba- basically, the bike revolutionized society full stop. Um, women had been sort of wearing men's clothes as women. Um, so it wasn't, you know, yes, it's, it's technically cross dressing because it's considered men's clothes, but they weren't trying to disguise themselves as men. They were quite clearly women who were wearing um, these garments. And then you see people like Amelia Bloomer in America picks this up. Um, and and what is called a wonderful phrase a skirt for each leg <laughs> you get these these bifurcated garments which they're they're starting to wear they were absolutely ridiculed when women started wearing bloomers which were they looked like a skirt but they they were separate you know legs um, and they were absolutely ridiculed they were called hideous hermaphrodites and all sorts of things um, and of course when the the bicycle came in you know it, it 
opened up the world for both men and women because here was a private means of transport that was relatively cheap and easy. You know, it was expensive to own a horse and, you know, you had to keep it, you had to groom it, you had to feed it. With a bike, you just shoved in the shed. Um, so the bike revolutionized society. Well, of course, women wanted to be part of it again. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that, you know, society tried to stop them. Um, no, they jumped on the bike and they went off. And initially, when they were wearing these bloomers or, or bifurcated dark garments, the reaction to them was awful. They could be dragged off the bike. They could be beaten up. There's quite a lot of stories of women being physically beaten up for appearing in society on a bike. Of course, you know, with the legs apart, uh, it was seen as absolutely shameful. And so that society felt that they had every right to beat these women up, you know, and, and so you know they did suffer enormously and so you see a, a, you know that slow progression which is again it's married with the women's suffragettes and and uh, suffragists and you know that it, it begins then to build into the whole thing about votes for women freedom for women so once you get into the late 19th century everything starts picking up speed um and it, it's you know becoming more acceptable but of course then you get first first world war comes along um, and the suffragettes and the suffragists stop. Um, but of course, women go on to serve in in the armed forces and start wearing trousers. And, and people are like, well, yeah, OK, we can see the point, you know. <laughs> so it is that again, it's that slow, slow burn for equal rights, which equal rights for everybody takes so long. Yeah, and, and then and when and when men are st- and as you, as you just mentioned, when men start to see the practicality of it. Um, again it's on men's terms isn't it which is you know quite sad yeah. but as you as you just mentioned a lot of the groundwork is being done earlier now a final fun question for you here uh, as we do for all our guests on the history of jackson uh, podcast you have mentioned an awful lot of stories within your book what is your favorite story that you wrote about and research for this book that's so difficult you know that is such a difficult question for two reasons one of all it it first of all it's it's a, a book about themes because um in the past people have taken the big juicy stories and have, have you know written about them and everything but they tend to ignore these tiny little what I call matchstick stories you know they, they only take up a few lines in the newspaper they flare up and they disappear um and people on the whole ignore them but I took them and stitched them all together into a theme so it's very very difficult to to get your teeth into one big story but there's lots of small stories that I absolutely love uh, such as the uh, the couple who wanted to get married and her father said, no, absolutely not. No. Um, but they ran off together and he follows them and uh, they're on a ferry, you know, sort of an old ferry with just them and the horses. And there's this um, sort of old man in the corner being supported by his grandson. And the father's looking for his daughter everywhere. And they get to the other <laughs> side and, the, you know, get off the ferry and he watches everybody getting off the ferry and he can't find his daughter. And he, he gets back on the ferry to go the, go back and turns around and the old man and the daughter who's been passing as a man are standing there waving at him, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he, do, he does forgive them in the end. He lets them marry, I, th- I think, for their... Uh... But again, I mean, and, and there's very touching stories, particularly the women sailors and soldiers. I, I love their story. Let's stop making films about super women. Let's stop making films about, you know... Um, mythological fictional women let's make stories and films about real women let's make films about women who really went to war and who were women female soldiers and sailors because some of their stories are just breathtaking um, there's a very very moving story of um, a war where a man uh, finds the body of a woman um, and he talks about how he she's so beautiful, like her hair has escaped and she's lying on the floor and um, he gets a handkerchief and he dips it in her blood and he keeps it as a memorial. And he gets his hussars to fire a salute over her body, despite the fact they're in the middle of the war and they could have been heard and caught, you know, and it's a very, very touching piece. And I think that's summed up for me anyway the whole story about women sailors and soldiers, they were brave, they died, they died for their country, they died for their beliefs. And let's make films about them. 
and and I, I definitely agree. Some of the stories that you mentioned are are movie quality, um, with you know the of the just what they did, where they went, their experiences, what they had to evade and escape, uh, just to live their lives, the, the life that they wanted to live. Uh, so yeah. I certainly certainly agree with that. Now you've been absolutely fantastic, Narita, uh, today, Narita. If, although of course they are, our audience are going to want to find you and interact with you online. Where can they find you amidst oh, the, oh, the death oh. of Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Twitter. Oh my gosh, I went on Twitter the other day and there was a post and it had like five likes and I was like, what? Yeah, um, yeah people people are jumping Twitter in their droves. Um, all the usual social media platforms, you can find me. Um, yeah, and, and I, I post, I do a lot of talks and, you know, both in person and online. So... Um, if anybody wants to come to any specific talks yeah fantastic i'll make sure your your social media links are in the description yeah. below and our audience are going to want to find a copy of your book uh, and read it themselves to you know expand upon some of the points that we've spoken about today where can they find this book uh, you can find it from all the usual books outlets and everything. The only thing I would ask is please buy it from an independent bookshop. Um, I know everybody goes to Amazon. I do. I'm just as bad. <laughs> um, but I do try and find people, um, independent booksellers. There's a bookseller called Queer Emporium in Cardiff. They will post you the book. They will, they will um, happily. Um, so yes, you can get it from Amazon. But even if you buy it on Amazon, please do try and buy it from a, a bookseller rather than from Amazon themselves, because we need to keep booksellers in, in work and support them. Fantastic. And I'll make sure there's a link for our audience below for a copy of that book. And there will be a pen and sword discount code for the book as well, which I will which I can't remember off the top of my head right now. <laughs> so that <laughs> will be is. with the link below. <laughs> and if our audience want to learn more about this topic and this subject, what would you recommend they go away and look at? um oh, it's the, the problem is it, it the most of the topic has been broken up like you know you can buy loads of books on female soldiers and female sailors and those that is the proper term if you google that you'll come up with lots of books about them um less so specifically about the other jobs um sort of like the labor um so uh, um, google cross-dressing um cross-dressing books and, and you'll get a number of them come up. Uh, but as I said, they tend to deal with specific themes um, like cross-dressing suffragettes, that sort of thing. Um, so it depends really what specifically you're interested in. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book because I wanted to show that it, it was uh, effective women across the board, that it, it isn't specific themes. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Uh, and I definitely know, you know, as you've just said, there is some, you know, world uh, world first, uh, first published outside their original. I can't speak today. Outside of their original sources published in your book, so it's definitely a great place for people to learn about different types of history that haven't been seen in the the light of day for about over a hundred years, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely recommend going away and read this. Well, oh, thank, thank you very you. much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, there we go. Stop the recording. <laughs>